Today's gospel reading, what do you think of it? It's not an easy one to understand. Would you agree? <laughs> Quite a few things are rather puzzling. What was Jesus doing in the region of Tyre and Sidon? Why didn't he want anyone to know that he was there? And how did this woman from the land of false gods know who Jesus was? And what to make of how Jesus responded to her request that was awkward, at least? And why did Jesus charge those people not to tell anyone about the miraculous healings that he had just performed? You see, many puzzles, many questions, so many confusing details in just a few verses. And the truth is, we cannot answer most of those questions. No one can, because there is no explanation given to us in Scriptures. How does this make you feel? What should we do when we cannot understand what the Scriptures tell us? That they do not give answers to those our questions. Then we should ask another question. What does this text do to us? What does this text and many other texts in the Bible, which are not easy to understand, what do they do to us? What impact do they have on us? How do they influence us? For one, <laughs> and this is important, even if it's not the most pleasant, such difficult texts remind us of who we are. The triune God is God. And we are not. <laughs> we are his little creatures, yes, loved beyond the comp comprehension, but still so limited and foolish and in need to learn and grow in our understanding. But think about this. Why do we often feel discomfort when, when we cannot understand what is going on? When we cannot understand what the text is telling us. Why? And the thing is, if we can understand and explain something, we in a way feel that we are in control, that we have conquered that territory or that topic or even that person. And even we as Christians, we, we have the desire to somehow put our God in a box. We would like to exercise some control over him, at least with our minds, to somehow tame him, to make him understandable, to, to make him predictable, maybe even to make him manageable. But we cannot. There is no subduing this God. There is no taming him. There is no putting him in a box. There is no grasping him with our feeble minds. He does what he does in a way he chooses. He does not ask for our permission. And often, he does not provide explanations. For he is God, and we are not. <laughs> so this is one thing that we are reminded when we read about what Jesus did then, and when we struggle to make sense of it. He is not accountable to us. He is not even comprehensible to us. He is the eternal one, the almighty one, the infinite one. He is in control, and we are not. <laughs> so the second thing that accounts like this do to us and for us is they invite us. Yes, invite us. They drive us deeper into the Scriptures and closer to the author of the Scriptures. Yes. If something is not immediately clear, it makes us search scriptures even more diligently and to listen to our God even more attentively. And as we do, good things happen. The Holy Spirit brings us closer and closer to Jesus. 
You see, we should rejoice when we encounter a count in the Bible that we cannot immediately understand, for they are good for us. They help us to remain humble as we listen to our God speaking to us in the words of scriptures, and they help us to grow closer to our God as we wrestle to understand His message. Okay, you may say, but uh, then uh, is there anything that we can learn from this passage? Anything that we can understand? Of course. <laughs> so let's reflect on, on two things today. First, let us learn about something, learn something about Jesus. And second, let us learn something about how to find him, how God leads us to Jesus. So first, what can we learn about Jesus? That he goes to strange places and does things we cannot understand. Why would he be hiding? And also that he says things that do not make much sense to us. The way he spoke to this poor Serphoenician woman, for example, as if he just wanted to drive her away. So how do you picture that conversation in your, in your mind with this woman? What was Jesus' tone? What was his body language? What were his intentions? I think that as we read this account, we try to paint a picture in, on those events in our minds, so don't we? But the reality is, we do not have enough information. We can only fill the gaps with our own ideas. And ours may not be the best judgment. Indeed, we do not know why Jesus went there. Maybe he was exhausted. Maybe he just wanted to have a week off. We do not know. Sure, why not? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We don't know how Jesus spoke with this woman. Was he angry because he was recognized? Was he disappointed that he could not get rest? Maybe he was just concerned that it was not yet the right time for the Son of God to be revealed to the Gentiles. Or maybe he simply wanted to test the woman's faith, to see whether she came motivated by some superstition, or did she truly know who Jesus was? We just don't know. But what we do know is what happened next. The surprising thing is that the woman indeed knew who Jesus was. She had a genuine, beautiful Christian faith. She knew him as her gracious and merciful Savior, who had come to bring the healing and restoration, not only to Israel, but to all the nations, to all the people, and, and also to her, and also to her daughter. Obviously, she had heard about Jesus. The Holy Spirit had enlightened her, and she trusted that Jesus is the one who brings the kingdom of God and defeats the powers of evil and chaos. And her humility before Jesus, her trust in him, her insistence were richly rewarded as Jesus spoke the words that she so, so longed to hear. For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. We cannot understand everything that our God does. We cannot put him in a box. But we can be assured that in Jesus we have gracious and merciful God. In Jesus we have God who understands our struggles and our pain. We have God who has come to share our flesh and our faith. 
We have God who hears our prayers, who is compassionate and caring. And then when the world, the flesh and devil attacks us, we know that in Jesus we have God whose heart belongs to us and whose faithfulness will not be shaken. And this is, this is what we know for sure. And that is a lot, that is a lot. God who understands you, God who walks with you exactly where you are, that's a lot. What more can, can someone wish for? And the second thing we can learn is about how one can find Jesus or, or how God leads someone to Jesus. Remember a few weeks ago, we, we had this reading from Gospel according to John chapter 6, where Jesus repeatedly stated that no one, no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. And in today's reading, we can see yeah, that if the Father draws someone, they will most certainly find Jesus. Jesus had traveled to the region where no one expected him to be. And he even wanted to hide. But the Syrophoenician woman still found him. The Spirit had revealed her who Jesus was. The Father had drawn her. And she came to Jesus. But there is something else. In those events which we read, something which seems counterintuitive. It seemed that sometimes Jesus deliberately makes it harder for people to find him. So what do I mean? We already reflected on how he how unusual was his engagement with the Syrophoenician woman? And what about the deaf and, and mute men whom he killed? And then he charged them not to tell anyone about what he had done. Why? Can you think of a better advertisement for Jesus' cause or for the church's cause? Jesus can heal. Our God can heal anyone. He can feed everyone, all of us. <laughs> Perhaps he can give us what we want. What a great message. Why did not Jesus use this to attract more people? Jesus knew it too well that those things will attract people. Yes, they did, and they do even today. But attracted by, by healing or feeding, people came to Jesus for wrong reasons. Those may be people who were not drawn by the Father, but by their own desires, by their own needs for all these healings and, and feedings. And Jesus' goal was not to gather as many people as possible, by giving them what they wanted and thus sort of making them his disciples, hoping that maybe one day, one day, they will recognize who he truly is and what he has come to bring us. Jesus charged not to tell anyone about his miracles, for he wanted to gather around him people whom the Father has drawn to him. People who would come for the right reasons. People who would come to him knowing who he is, the Son of God, true God, true man. Who would know why Jesus has come. Not to feed and heal us, even <laughs> as in his grace he often does it. But ultimately to rescue us from our greatest enemies, from sin and death and devil. He was looking for people who would know what Jesus has brought us. The medicine of eternal life. The forgiveness of all our sins. The salvation and true life. The resurrection of the body and life with Jesus in his kingdom forever. 
And it is not that hard to gather people in one place. <laughs> Christians are often tempted to do just that. Give them what they want, find ways to please them, something interesting, and they will come. But try to offer them what the triune God wants for them. And only a chosen few will respond. As Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, remember famous, famous verse, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Brothers and sisters, do you see how this brings us great joy and comfort? You are here. You are here. It means that the Father himself has drawn you. Yes, that he has given you his spirit as a guarantee of the inheritance which you will receive in his kingdom. It means that you are his own, belonging to God, redeemed and rescued. And as Jesus said, no one is able to snatch you out of the Father's hand. And as Paul said, no one and nothing will break, will ever be able to separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the source of our joy. And it also means that we do not need to try to attract anyone to come to Jesus by simply pleasing them. To draw someone to Jesus, that is the Father's job. The Father's job, not ours. We are simply to share the good news about Jesus as faithfully, as winsomely as we can. We are to pray for all people in our lives and let the Holy Spirit do his job. We cannot make anyone a Christian by our own efforts. Yes, what we can and what we should do is we should walk with all people in our lives. We should care for them. We should tell them what God has done for them in Jesus. And we should tell them that their sins can be forgiven, their captivity to evil powers broken, true freedom and eternal life given, relationship with the God the Father restored. We should tell all of this as winsomely as we can. And then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. And we can be assured that God's word will accomplish what it is sent to do. So this much for today. Remember, every bit, every bit of the sacred scripture is given to us to bring you God's blessings, to draw you closer to Jesus so that we can have more wisdom more understanding, more joy, more peace, more hope, more assurance that one day, one day, our God will bring you where he wants you to be. That is, with him, in his near presence, forever, a new heavens, a new earth. As Luther put it, to live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And remember, Jesus has already begun to prepare a place for, for you. And what a place it will be. What a place it will be. Amen.